Okay, in this video, I'm going to give you an overview of cytotoxic chemotherapy, which is chemotherapy which targets directly the DNA replication machinery, or it targets tubulin to prevent mitosis. So cytotoxic chemotherapy targets cells that are undergoing the cell cycle mostly. So we're dealing with cells that are either in S phase, where DNA replication is taking place, or cells that are in M phase, where we have chromosome segregation going on. So some of our DNA targeted agents will also disrupt translation. For example, 5-fluorouracil and doxorubicin will inhibit dis um, translation as well as affect uh, DNA integrity. And uh, some agents that affect chromosome segregation, such as the tubulin inhibitors, can also act as vascular disrupting agents, and the drug combratostatin falls into this category. So these are the main classes of cytotoxic chemotherapy. We've got the alkylating agents and antimetabolites, which I'll go through in, in some detail. Topper isomerases, which include drugs like doxorubicin. We've got cytotoxic antibiotics, which are a fairly diverse group of uh, molecules. And then anti antimicrotubule agents. So I'll cover those in the next session, which focuses on tubulin inhibitors. So first up are the alkylating agents. So these kill the most rapidly dividing cells uh, by disrupting DNA synthesis. So these are highly reactive molecules that will cross-react with DNA. So they'll basically bind to DNA and either mutate the DNA or cross-link individual bases to other bases. So within this group we've got the nitrogen mustards, which are fairly non-specific alkylating agents. Nitrosyureas, these are particularly useful for crossing the blood-brain barrier. Uh, the platinum derivative, so cisplatin, is the main one that you're likely to come across. Um, all of these will form direct DNA binding or DNA cross-linking, and this results in impaired DNA replication at the replication fork. So you get a replication fork that encounters these and usually becomes stalled. A lot of the platinum drugs, these are particularly uh, potent cross-linking drugs. Uh, cisplatin, carboplatin, oxaloplatin, they react with water, within the cells uh, by this equation uh, reaction. And what happens is this uh, cisplatin in this form binds very potently with deoxyguanine. And this forms either intra or interstrand crosslinks uh, with uh, deoxyguanine or deoxyadenine. The direct result of this is stalled DNA replication forks. And these need to be repaired by the DNA damage uh, repair systems and if that can't happen the cells will be unable to divide and should undergo apoptosis and that's the primary aim of this group of chemotherapy chemotherapeutics. Now the antimetabolite class are more involved in uh, preventing the formation of new deoxyribonucleotides. So these agents uh, which are shown down here these are particularly useful at preventing the pool of available nucleotides to be present and therefore DNA replication will cease. So here we've got gemcitabine which is similar in structure to deoxycytidine which is a precursor of the uh, deoxynucleoside triphosphates that are used for DNA synthesis. So this structure will result in the uh, disruption of um, deoxycytidine triphosphate formation if that occurs, you get a reduced pool of those uh, nucleotide triphosphates, and therefore uh, you cannot have DNA synthesis. Okay, this group of antimetabolites uh, involves uh, methotrexate, uh, and this alters the folic acid synthesis pathway. So folic acid is a crucial uh, molecule that are required for thymidine synthesis. And folic acid metabolite, which is dihydrofolate, that's converted to the active tetrahydrofolate by dihydrofolate reductase, which is DHFR, shown here. Methotrexate, which is an antimetabolite, blocks DHFR. And the net result of blocking DHFR means that um, these cells are unable to make certain nucleotide precursors, stopping DNA replication because there is a lack of pool of nucleotides. So in some uh, combination chemotherapy regimes, uh, agents such as leucovorin or folinic acid is uh, included, and this can protect against uh, bone marrow suppression, which is one of the key side effects of methotrexate. So the way this drug combination works is you can give your methotrexate 
and then a few days later you can give this agent and that will effectively uh, alleviate some of the side effects caused by methotrexate. So in this slide you can see uh, where certain antimetabolites are acting. So here you can see that um, thymidinolate synthetase converts DUMP into DTMP, that's uh, deoxyuridine monophosphate into deoxythymidine monophosphate. So 5-fluorouracil directly blocks this enzyme that does this conversion, uh, so blocks the formation of this species here. This deoxy-TMP is also shown in this red box, which is a precursor to deoxy-TTP. So if we are blocking thymidinolate synthetase here, we are resulting in a reduction of deoxy-TTP. If we have a reduction of deoxy-TTP, DNA synthesis cannot occur. What you can also see is that this reaction relies upon uh, tetrahydrofolate and dihydrofolate. So when this occurs, tetrahydrofolate is converted to dihydrofolate, and then DHFR converts dihydrofolate back to tetrahydrofolate. And this is just a reminder that this enzyme, DHFR, is what methotrexate is inhibiting. Therefore, we've got two different antimetabolites both acting on this step here. The net effect of that is a depletion of deoxyTTP. If you've got a depletion of deoxyTTP, then you can't do DNA synthesis and the cell should undergo apoptosis. So the next major group are the topper isomerase inhibitors. So this includes agents such as doxorubicin. And if you remember back to the previous lecture, uh, topper isomerase cuts uh, DNA, cuts one of the strands of double-stranded DNA to allow DNA to pivot around the axis of a single um, phosphodiester bond allowing the uh, tension to be taken out of DNA as it is uncoiled by um, helicase. Since both replication and translation require helicase-mediated unwinding, both of these pr processes are inhibited by uh, top isomerase inhibitors. So this is why agents such as doxorubicin can prevent both DNA replication but also affect uh, translation not translation, transcription. So these are the main topper isomerase inhibitors and their mechanism of action. So you've got your topper isomerase 1 inhibitors, for example, camptothecin. Um, and this works by uh, preventing re-ligation of DNA after that initial single strand of DNA cleavage. So as topper isomerase tries to cut a single strand and allow pivoting of DNA around the single bond, um, then the topper isomerase tries to re-ligate re that back together. This is what this class of drugs does. They prevent that re-ligation. You end up with that single strand uh, double, uh, DNA break, eventually forming a double strand DNA break, typically when that uh, a replication fork reaches that point and the replication fork will collapse. Of the TOPO2 inhibitors, etoposide acts in a similar way. That prevents re-ligation, leading to double strand DNA breaks. Doxorubicin intercalates in between bases and this prevents topper isomerase 2 from so it inhibits topper isomerase 2 activity so we get reduced um, relieving of supercoiling wherever we've got transcription, I should say transcription, and wherever we've got a replication fork. So with topper isomerase 2 inhibitors we'll get lots of stalled replication forks, but we'll also have this effect on transcription. Now some key um, Chemotherapy agents work perfectly well on their own. When I say perfectly well, they have some activity. Uh, what often occurs is that multiple agents for multiple different groups of chemicals are given together as a single treatment. And this is what we call combination cytotoxic therapy. And if uh, multiple agents are given together, there are certain principles that need to be adhered to. Uh, to make sure that they actually work well together rather than just double the amount of toxicity. So each component should have um, single agent activity, that is it should be a cytotoxic chemotherapy in its own right with no cross resistance with the other drugs that it's been used with. For example, if the P-glycoprotein overexpression causes resistance to one drug, you shouldn't use it with another drug where, where resistance occurs by the same mechanism. This is because if as soon as the uh, cancer 
figures out how to increase peak glycoprotein, it means that all of the drugs that you're given are simultaneously inactive. There should always be some evidence that the drugs work in synergy with each other. That is, if you give a certain amount of one drug and then give a certain amount of another drug, by combining them together you should effectively get more than double the activity or when you combine them together. So when we say synergy, what we're talking about is a greater than additive response. And what you would want to happen is both drugs working on maybe two different bits of a pathway and they both work together far better when you've got both drugs together than each agent individually. So the example here is where if you can stall the replication fault using oxaloplatin, will you require a pool of uh, nucleotides to repair that damage if you're inducing lots of stalled replication faults you need lots of nucleotides. If you're putting in 5-fluorouracil, then you are depleting deoxyTTP. So those two agents may well be two that there's a rationale for using together. Finally, and this is sort of fairly common sense, is that the agents that you use shouldn't have overlapping safety profiles. So if one agent is really bad for depleting the bone marrow, it would be not very sensible to use another agent which is known to deplete the bone marrow if that's not what you're aiming to do. So Folfox, which is uh, a drug combination that you should have studied in one of your labs, is a well-known, reasonably well-tolerated uh, drug combination of oxaloplatin, 5-fluorouracil, which synergize together, and then you've got folinic acid, which is there to protect against bone marrow suppression, and we came across folinic acid earlier on. Uh, we can also go do sequential chemotherapy, so whereas combination chemotherapy might be involved in giving the same drugs effectively at the same time or in very close proximity to each other, sequential chemotherapy has uh, regimes where you maybe have a course of one drug here, gemcitabine, and then course of another drug, paclitaxel. So in this situation, gemcitabine, which is a, a nucleoside analogue, introduce a non-native base which has to be repaired by DNA repair and we'll learn about that later and the resistance mechanism there is P-glycoprotein efflux pumps. In contrast paclitaxel which is a tubulin inhibitor which we're going to cover in the next session is a mitotic spindle inhibitor and the primary resistance to this seems to be a uh, well, fairly complex mechanism but one of which is altered tubulin isoforms which no longer bind to paclitaxel so this is a different resistance profile to this drug, gemcitabine, so they've both got different anti-tumor mechanisms and different resistance uh, mechanisms. So if you give lots of gemcitabine, you, what you shouldn't be doing is priming the cancer to then be resistant to the second sequential chemotherapy agent, and this is one of the main uh, rules of sequential chemotherapy. So what you should be able to do now is explain the mechanism of action of um, the major cytotoxic chemotherapy agents with the exception of tubulin which is going to come in the next session uh, you should be able to explain why certain agents are used alongside each other because they have synergistic uh, but different mechanisms of action and equally they shouldn't have an overlapping resistance profile so if you see a drug that is where its primary resistance mechanism as p glycoprotein efflux pumps and another drug which the, me uh, the resistance mechanism is exactly the same those two drugs shouldn't really be used together because as soon as the cancer gets resistance to one, you will uh, get resistance to the other.